gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, not only because it is the first time that there is an official representation of the United States at this event, but because it happens to come in the shape of the Vice President of the United States, Her Excellence Kamala Harris. Thank you. Thank you, President Macron, for hosting this forum and for the warm welcome. Today, we stand together at the start of a new era in our world, inspired by the possibility of our shared future, united by the bold ambition of our shared ideals. And so it is an honor to be here today to join leaders from nations around the world in discussing one such ideal, equality. To reach this ideal, we must acknowledge that inequality has always existed in our world. The gaps between the rich and poor, men and women, the global north and south have existed throughout our history. To be sure, there are moments in which these gaps have narrowed and moments in which they've widened. Most recently and throughout this pandemic, the gaps have undoubtedly become larger. Globally, extreme poverty is on the rise, as is extreme wealth. The progress we have made on gender equality is under threat. Experts suggest it will now take decades longer for women to achieve parity with men. And with school closures worldwide, the struggle to ensure that every child has access to a quality education has become that much more difficult. By virtually every measure, the gaps have grown. As the leaders of today, we are being confronted with this challenge, which is immense in both size and scale. At times like this, there are some who see what is happening and accept it. They accept it as something that has always existed and always will. But there are others who see what is happening and ask, why? When I arrived in Paris, I visited the Institut Pasteur and reflected on the work of my mother. My mother, you see, had two goals in her life, to raise her two daughters and to end breast cancer. At the age of 19, my mother arrived in the United States from India to study science. Throughout her career as a breast cancer researcher, she collaborated with scientists worldwide, including right here in Paris at the Institut Pasteur. And you see, when you are a daughter of a scientist, science has a way of shaping how you think. My mother and her work taught me the power of a short and very important question. That question being, why? History is full of leaders. Leaders in science, in politics, in business, in the arts, in education. Leaders who refused to accept the status quo. Who asked why. Who took action. And because they did, they changed our world. Well, today, we face a dramatic rise in inequality, and we must rise to meet this moment. I believe that we as leaders must ask why this inequality persists. We all know that this is a pivotal moment in the history of our world. We are nearly two years into a global pandemic, five million lives lost, countless livelihoods have been lost, but the pandemic has also presented us with an opportunity, an opportunity 
because many in our world who perhaps did not see now clearly see the gaps. And the call for leaders to bridge the gaps is rightfully growing, more urgent and more insistent. In this moment, leaders must reckon with the magnitude of this challenge by asking, why is it that 1% of the world now owns 45% of the world's wealth? Why is it that one in four people in our world lack access to clean drinking water at home? Why is it that one in three women in the world experience sexual or physical violence during her lifetime? Why is it that only half of the world has access to the internet? Why have we allowed so many of the world's children to go hungry when we know that we produce enough food to feed the entire world? We cannot be aware of these gaps and simply resign ourselves to them. We cannot accept them by thinking simply this is what has always been and what will always be. We must instead agree that these growing gaps are unacceptable. And we must agree to work together to bridge them. And here, I want to be clear. This is not about charity. This is about our duty and what we owe to each other as human beings. This is also a strategic imperative. As I've said many times, our world is more interconnected and interdependent than ever before. A virus can spread globally in a matter of months. A hacker in one nation can shut down the critical infrastructure of another. Emissions anywhere can increase air pollution everywhere. In the 21st century, our fates are linked, as is our future. In the 21st century, our nations are interconnected and our people are interconnected. And so, in the 21st century, addressing inequality is a strategic imperative for each of us, for our security and our health, our shared prosperity and our collective future. All of which brings me back to this very moment. As we recover from this pandemic, from this crisis, we must challenge the status quo and build something better. As leaders of our world, we must rise to meet this moment, to get at the root of this challenge. We must look critically at the norms that are holding people back from achieving all that they can. To get at the root of this challenge, we must look critically at the long-standing systems and structures that are fractured and fissured. And we must fix them. First, by taking action at home. And second, by showing solidarity as a global community. For our part, the United States is committed to addressing our own systemic gaps. In fact, it has been a priority of our administration. Just before I traveled here, our Congress passed a landmark piece of legislation to make an historic investment in our nation's infrastructure. Another bill that will support our nation's workers and families and help us meet our climate commitment is poised to pass soon. Together, these bills are designed to lift people out of poverty, to put people to work in good jobs, and help bridge the gaps that persist in our nation. And as we make progress at home, we recognize our obligation 
to other nations around the world. To that end, we are doubling our climate funding for those nations hardest hit, pledging more than one billion vaccines worldwide, and sending development assistance to nations throughout the world. And we know there is more we can do and more we must do. But the fact remains, no single nation can take on inequality alone. A challenge this sizable and seismic demands that our world work together in solidarity. And we have seen what is possible when we do. Less than two weeks ago, our world joined together at the G20 summit in Italy, and there leaders from nations that comprise 80% of global GDP agreed to the global minimum tax. This agreement will ensure that corporations, no matter how large, no matter how global, will no longer be able to avoid paying their fair share. And in so doing, it will give countries a greater ability to invest in their people. Now, to be sure, this is just one step. But it shows us what is possible when the world joins together. And we all remember when the world joined together to issue a universal declaration on human rights. We saw what is possible when the world joined together to launch the International Space Station. We saw what is possible when the world together eradicated smallpox we saw what is possible. And I believe that in this pivotal moment, if we join together, there is no challenge that is too big for us to take on. So I will conclude with this. When we acknowledge what is happening in our world, what is actually happening in our world, and then ask ourselves, why? We open ourselves up to the possibility that the future can be different, that the future can be better. And in that way, this question is a key to any progress, and it is critical to our shared future. So I challenge all of us here today government leaders, business leaders, community leaders. Let's continue to ask why. And then let's take action. There is the power of the people. And there are the people who are in power. And it will take all of us to meet this challenge. So as we go forward from this place, let us not be burdened by what has been. Let us focus on what can be. And let us realize a better future together. Thank you. Madam Vice President, thank you so much for those, those words uh, full of hope uh, and uh, also that idea that perhaps humanity was sick before in a sort of unacknowledged way, a sickness or fatalism perhaps that we can now choose to shed. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to commemorate this moment, we will now take the official photo of the Paris Peace Forum. We kindly ask you all to stand up. Mesdames et Messieurs, Afin d'immortaliser ce moment, nous allons réaliser la photographie officielle du Forum de Paris sur la paix. Nous vous remercions de bien vouloir vous lever. Please keep your mask on and put anything you might have in your hands on your seat, including your interpretation equipment. Merci de garder votre masque et de poser sur votre siège ce que vous pourriez avoir dans les mains ainsi que votre équipement d'interprétation. Please raise your head 
and look towards the light point located high up in the center of the stage. Merci de lever votre tête et de diriger votre regard vers le point lumineux qui se situe en haut de l'écran, au centre. 3, 2, 1. 3, 2, 1. Please look at the light point a second time. Nous vous remercions de bien vouloir diriger à nouveau votre regard vers le point lumineux. 3, 2, 1. 3, 2, 1. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, do please have a seat. Uh, it is time now for the, our first session and the end of uh, today's official opening ceremony. Thank you so much for taking part. It's been such a pleasure listening to you all. Alex Taylor is going to come on stage now to speak about our first uh, session uh, to begin with. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Melissa. It's my pleasure to uh, be hosting uh, this uh, two round tables. Now, in order to introduce uh, this round table, it's my pleasure to ask Your Excellency, uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, to say a few words. Thank you very much indeed. Again, thank you, President Macron for hosting this forum and this very important meeting. It is an honor to be here with these distinguished leaders, of course, from government, business, and civil society. Earlier this evening, I spoke about how we are at the start of a new era in our world. And indeed, as we discussed, the pandemic has been a turning point and a tipping point. As I've said, our world is more interconnected and more interdependent than ever before. Nowhere is that probably more evident than in the digital domain. I grew up in California uh, with Silicon Valley literally in my backyard. And I watched, as we all did, the rapid shift from analog to digital technology. We all watched the rise of the internet and of social media. And it is undeniable, technology has the power to unlock opportunity for the people of the world, there are people using the internet to share information and opinions, activists using social media platforms to speak out for justice, scientists using satellite images to mitigate the impact of climate change, innovators using technology to help low-income nations leap forward. Mobile banking is giving more people the opportunity to participate in the global economy and of course, as we've seen in particular during the pandemic, telemedicine is giving more people the opportunity to consult a healthcare professional. But just as technology has created more opportunities, it has also created more risks and threats. As a former prosecutor and years as an elected official, I have seen firsthand how women and children have been exploited online and privacy has been compromised. I have seen firsthand how hate and violent extremism is stoked online, and misinformation can be spread, threatening democracies. And of course, we have all seen how autocrats are using technology to crack down on journalists and activists, how hackers and ransomware attacks disrupt critical infrastructure, how foreign interference has undermined democratic elections. To address these risks and these threats, I am clear that our world must join together. And that is why I am honored to announce that the United States, President Macron, supports the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to working to advance security in cyberspace, to promote stability in cyberspace, and to ensure shared prosperity. This commitment extends from what we do at home to what we are doing in solidarity with the world. At home, we have made significant progress. In May, President Joe Biden signed an executive order to make bold improvements to our cybersecurity. 
And just last week, our Congress passed a historic bill to upgrade our digital and physical infrastructure. Similarly, with the world, we have made strides. Together with other nations, our administration has named those responsible for malicious cyber activity. I firmly believe that there must be consequence whenever security and stability are being threatened in cyberspace. Our nation has also joined the Christchurch call, and we are determined to work with our allies and partners to eliminate terrorist content online. For the United States, our approach to the digital domain is rooted in our democratic principles. We will continue to advocate for an open, secure, and interoperable internet, and work to ensure that technology helps, not harms, the people of our world. And I'll conclude with this. Gathered here tonight, leaders of government, business, and civil society. At the start of this new era, we are all pioneers, standing together in the dynamism of the present, on the brink of the unknown. It is up to us, all of us, to strengthen our nations and protect our citizens. It is up to us, all of us, to realize the opportunities of technology and minimize the threats. In a world that is more interconnected and interdependent, let us go forward together. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vice uh, President, and uh, for making that uh, announcement, which uh, I'm sure will uh, please uh, the President uh, a lot. Ask you to stay on the stage. We have a group uh, photograph. Donc uh, encore une dernière uh, photo. Merci. So one last photo. Please stay. Maybe you could stand up, as you wish. A few other people uh, to come on the stage. Uh, Vice President, Your Excellency, you're more than welcome if you want to uh, join us uh, for the uh, photo. Uh, Mr. Jean-Yves Le Drian, Minister de l'Europe et des Affaires. So Jean-Yves Le Drian, Minister for Europe and the Foreign Affairs. Adrien Taquet, Secretary of State to the Minister of Solidarity and Health in charge of Childhood and Families. Cédric O. State Secretary for the Digital Economy and the Minister of Social Cohesion and Relations with Territorial Collectivity in charge of the digital transition and, communi and electronic communications. Fayez King, Executive Director of UNICEF, thank you very much for being here. Kobin Leibovitz, President of Quant, and Anne Bido, Director General of Plan International. Thank you very much. If you could take off your masks. And if you give them a big round of applause, I'm sure they're all going to smile and the photo will be much more engaging. Thank you very much indeed. Merci à tous. Thanks to all of you. I'm sorry, could, could we ask you to do a second photo, a deuxième photo, s'il vous plaît, donc restez, voilà.